My father told me a story once. I'll never forget it for a few reasons. I think it's the first story he ever told me as a child. It's also the story of how my grandfather died. But honestly, that isn't the reason. You hear stories on TV or sometimes you overhear something in a public place. People talk about ghosts and aliens and you think to yourself, that ain't real. They're making it up, or they're mistaken, or they're crazy, or something like that. You just can't believe it until something happens. Something that brings it all together, connects the dots in a way you didn't think of before. Maybe it happens to you. Maybe you hear the same story again and again happening to different people. It doesn't take long for the world to become a lot bigger than you thought it was. As I said, this is the story my father told me, but I never believed it, even though he swore up and down it was true. It wasn't until I started clicking around on the internet I started to believe. I started to hear the other stories just like the one my father told me. It didn't take me long to believe in the rake. That's not what my father called it, of course. He's never used the internet in his life. He wouldn't know what the consensus has been to take into naming it. When he chose to call it something other than it, or that thing, he called it Skinwalker, after an old Cherokee tale his grandfather told him. But I'll tell you the story the way he told it to me. We were out hunting one night. He'd tell me. Coyotes. We'd kill them 50 bucks a skin. They lived on a dairy farm in Ohio. They'd kill calves sometimes. We'd do it every night because we needed the money and sometimes while we were out we'd come on a deer and kill it. Our landlord didn't mind and it could have feed our family for a few nights and save us some money. Anyway, we were done making our rounds and heading home and walking because we didn't have a car or some four wheeler back then. We cut through the woods. That's when we came upon it blood everywhere splattered on the trees in the grass in the creek everywhere at first we figured it was a pack of coyotes we'd seen it sometimes they can't scavenge and start hunting deer or cattle the worst was when they breed with feral dogs but, but this wasn't like that See, when a pack of dogs or wolves or coyotes attack something, they do it right. They'll pick off of one that's weak or sick or old or just small. They'll hunt it and draw it onto a corner or something, some place it can't get out of. And they'll run it right to the biggest one, the alpha. And that deer will never see that alpha. You might hear it, but it won't see it. It'll just notice that his throat's gone and <laughs> it'll drop dead, buddy. It's quick. It's clean. That wasn't what happened to me. Something had run up on a deer, a den of deer. Coyotes won't attack a den. Wolves neither because they get too much of a fight. And there were three, I think. Three bodies. Just torn apart. You'd see a head here, a leg there, a torso there. Predators don't do that, you know. They don't leave behind scraps. What had done this hadn't done it for food. They'd done it for fun. We didn't know that. We saw a bunch of carcasses and we think it's something we gotta take care of. I remember my dad telling me to go home. He thought it was a pack of feral dogs. I wasn't leaving him. And I damn sure wasn't walking through two miles of woods alone. With nothing but a 22 and a pocket knife. Dad had the shotgun. And I wasn't going anywhere without it. it took me a while to convince him. But we finally we began tracking whatever did it. It wasn't hard either. We just followed the blood. Either that thing bled a deer before it got away, or it dragged one for a mile. 
I don't know. I, I know that I'd never seen my dad scared before that night, though. We started hearing noises. I've been in a lot of woods in my life, and I've been all over the world, and ain't never heard noises like I heard that night. I heard things screaming. Heard deer, and fox, and rabbits, and raccoons, and birds. Just scared. Keep in mind, this is maybe 12 or 1 o'clock. Except the fox and some birds, nothing was supposed to even be awake. They weren't just awake, they were moving. I saw fox and birds that night fly straight into trees just trying to get out of there. We came upon a pack of coyotes and nearly shot a couple thinking it was what we were looking for. But then we saw they were running toward us. They ran right past us and didn't even notice us. Then some deer did the same. And some rabbits, some squirrels, foxes, even a couple wild hogs. These things were supposed to be eating each other and the only thing they cared about was getting out of there. We should have put it together, but I don't know. That, that may be whatever we were tracking. It wasn't something we were supposed to see and it wasn't something we could kill. I don't know why we didn't just go home then. I guess we was just curious. I think that was my dad's nature to go toward the trouble, you know, to fight. And knowing what I knew about what my father did during the war, my nature was to stay close to him. That's for sure. We finally get into an open valley. It was normally a soy field, but it wasn't in season, so it was just flat dirt. We saw the tracks, then. A lot of the animals flee in the forest had paved over the land. But uh, where that deer blood was, nothing had taken a single step. It's like they were leaving the forest to find. The tracks were shallow. Whatever it was couldn't have weighed more than 100 pounds. But that didn't mean much. Bobcat weighing 40 pounds wet nearly tore out my damn throat one time. All that means is that it's quick and it's hard to hit. So we follow the tracks and it doesn't take us long to find where it is. There's this old schoolhouse that sits on the top of the hill. Half of it had been ripped out by a tornado but nobody lived there not for a long time. We caught homeless people in there, sometimes, or druggies looking for a safe place to shoot up. We figured maybe that that was it. Maybe it was some sick kid riding a high. We didn't think that for long. We get within 50 yards and we hear this noise. A screeching kind of sound. It was sort of made up of two different sounds. One was a high-pitched screech. Another was a low pitched growl. It was making both at the same time. We get within 20 yards and we hear this sound. I can remember thinking that it sounded like paper being torn apart while someone was swinging water in a bucket back and forth. Dad looks at me, kneels down, and whispers, I gotta stay behind him. So we're about to corner him. Any animal will fight when it's cornered, especially when it's a predator. But we, we can tell by the tracks that, that it's just one. He tells me it's probably a single, feral dog, and it's probably rabid. So the plan is to sneak up on it while it's eating, shoot it, and then keep shooting until it don't move no more. Then slit his throat, make sure he's dead. And if it gets to dad, it's my job to shoot it or stab it to get it off of him. So he walks up and I'm right behind him, I'm just a tad to his side, and I can see what it is. I wish to this day I hadn't. It was leaning over a carcass, tears off its flesh and throws what it doesn't nibble at his side. There's blood all over the brick, glistening in the moonlight. It's pale white, 
human looking, but not quite human. It had arms and legs like a human, but it sat by, like a monkey, hunched over, and its hands weren't normal. It had long fingers with claws at the end of them. So we see that, and my dad hesitates, right? He wasn't about to fire on a person, so he cleared his throat and tried to get it to turn around. And I swear to God, all the noise just ceased. I ain't never heard true silence before that, and not after that. But for two seconds, nothing, nothing made any noise. Which made it all the louder when it turned around, made this shrill cry, and jumped on Dad. He got a shot off. I think he missed. If he hit the thing, it didn't mind. But it was on him. Tears parts off of him. I start shooting it with the 22 point blank, but it barely bled the damn thing. I got off five rounds, and then I started hitting it with the gun butt. But it wasn't budging. It didn't even register that I was there. It's clawing at my dad, taking off bits of his flesh. It starts on his torso, ripping off the skin. It, his t and then, then it moves up. It tore off his throat. It tore off his nose, his eyes, it scalped him. And then it started digging in, ripped off the bottom half of his jaw. The little bones and that tube in your neck. And then his ribs. I don't exactly remember what happened. Somehow my dad's knife ends up in this thing's shoulder, but my dad ends up on my back. I'm running, and by God, I'm running faster than I'd ever run before or after. Dad on my back, and it's following me. I end up back in the woods, opposite the ones we've been in. I'm heading towards my landlord's house, because it's half a mile away. I can hear this thing screeching and moaning. I hear these tree branches crack and get thrown around. Sounds like someone's taking an axe at every single tree I pass. It's cracking so loud and often, but I just ain't looking back. Finally, I trip in the gravel. I look up and there's my landlord and a bunch of his buddies drinking around the campfire. I scream and I cry and they come over. I'm telling him to call an ambulance and he looks at me and I'll never forget what he said. What's that on your back? He asked me. Just as he said it, he saw one of those god-awful flannel shirts my dad wore everywhere. It was what was left of my dad. Most of his head, his torso, but nothing after the waist. Suddenly we hear it screeching. He grabs me. My dad gets thrown on the ground. I'm fighting him, crying, because I think we can still save dad. Somehow, but my dad had been gone before I ever even picked him up. He has to pick me up and throw me inside before I come with him. He and his buddies were all inside and they're locking doors and getting guns. The landlord's asking me, what happened? What happened? But I just know what to tell him. Don't know what to tell him. He pieced enough of it together to understand that there was something dangerous there. All the lights in the house are on and someone calls the cops. They'll be there in about 15 minutes or so. We look outside and see it walk in front of the fire they made. Don't know what it is. One of them says it looks like an ape. Suddenly something goes through the window. We shoot at it, but it ain't. It ain't the thing. It's my landlord's dog. Just the body, though. Not his head or his legs. So we start pushing things in front of doors and windows. When we hear something, in the garage. I remember one of his friends saying that the doors were open. I hear the metal and glass just get ripped apart. You put a couch and a TV in front of the door to the garage. You 
banged around some more and then it got quiet. Not silent like it was before. We could hear it move around some and the guys were talking, making sure the guns were ready. Someone hands me a pistol. No sooner did I cock the hammer back did we hear something shatter upstairs. Then we heard a screech again, except now it was louder and it didn't echo and fade out because it was inside. We all rushed to the one door leading upstairs and we got it. it we got to it just as the thing did. It opened it just a bit and four or five men just slammed into it. It got its hand through. Someone with a shotgun took care of that. Put the barrel right up to its wrist and pulled the trigger. Cut its hand off clean. That only pissed it off though. It started pushing on that door clawing. We were on one side pushing as best we could and it was on the other doing the same. That wood just wasn't going to hold and someone tells us to keep our heads down. Suddenly, the top half of the door is just gone. My ears are ringing and there are splinters everywhere. Two or three of them just loaded on the top of that door. I don't really know where it went after that. The police got there. I was still glued to that door or what was left of it. The sun was up before they got me off of it. They put me in a hospital for a while. A lot of people talked to me, but I didn't talk back. Not for a long, long time. When I got back home, I got a job for the landlord working on the farm. We didn't talk much. Not about the thing. But I signed up for the army when I was 19 and he sat me down to drink some scotch as a send off. I asked him right away what the police told him. The story they went with was a wild animal, probably a wolf or maybe a bear that had migrated north. I asked him how they could say that when they had the hand and he looks at me stunned. He tells me that hand never made it back to the station. The cop who had it in his car wrecked, drove into a tree and died on impact and the hand was never found, probably taken away by some animal. The cops, when they acknowledged the hand existed at all, said it was simply the paw of a bear that looked like a human hand. He knew it was bullshit. I never talked to the landlord again. He went missing when I was in basic. Never found him. They said he owed some people some money and just ran away. Yeah, but I don't think that's that simple. I never went back to those woods. I wouldn't even if I had the whole goddamn U.S. Army at my back. But that was a lie. When my mother died, I didn't think my father felt he had anything left, and that he might as well settle old scores. He went into those woods. He never came back. FBI was called. I did a show for everyone involved, but I knew they weren't really looking. I had to get one drunk and slip him a few fifties before he finally told me that they get a few calls about those woods every year about someone up and vanishing. But that was all he wanted to tell me. Before he got up and left with the rest of his team, he wrote, The Rake, onto a napkin. I didn't know what it meant until I searched for it on the internet. Honestly, I would have rather not known. <laughs> <laughs>